Good morning, everyone. We hope you had a phenomenal 4th of July weekend. We have a great show planned for you all today. Glenn Greenwald joins us to discuss Julian Assange's indictment. Plus, Assange's brother, Gabriel Shipton, joins us to share his perspective. And of course, Team Rising is here. But first, we wanted to discuss the ongoing infrastructure saga. There's always a lot to talk about when it comes to infrastructure, but especially now as the negotiations um, are heating up. According to the AP, activists and their allies in Congress are pressing for huge investments to slow global warming. The bipartisan infrastructure plan eliminated some of Biden's key climate initiatives, including plans to make electricity carbon free by 2035 and to spend hundreds of billions in tax incentives for clean energy, such as wind and solar power technologies. This comes as the effects of climate change, like worsening hurricanes, droughts and wildfires are increasing. Take a look at this video. The ocean is literally on fire. So a bunch of people were sharing this over, over the weekend, and there's, there's, it, it's such an amazing metaphor uh, because you have these, uh, these first responder ships approaching a fire in the Gulf trying to spray water. <laughs> yeah, on, on, on an ocean fire. On, on top of it. <laughs> and there's something so metaphorical about our efforts to stave off uh, the apocalypse right there. Like, <laughs> we're doing everything we can, and we're trying. Like, we, we, we really are. <laughs> Not sure it's best thought out right. <laughs> and not sure it's actually going to be that effective. Ironically, um, burn, the fact that it's burning is better than the BP oil spill, which was just well, actually the BP was the BP one burning too. Um, when, when you release methane gas into the air, if you if you burn it, the 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 the, the carbon effect is much um, diminished. Right. And, and the so the methane effect, like the greenhouse gas effect is diminished. It's still awful. Right. Um, but it's different than, the, than the, the, the kind of pure release of the gases. Sure. This is um, a, a natural gas, a rupture of a natural gas pipeline um, that was overseen by Pemex in Mexico. Mm -hmm. um, and Ryan, I guess I'm just curious as to what you think there is in, is there anything in these infrastructure negotiations that would prevent something like this from happening with an American company? Well, no, no. The only thing that prevents uh, an accident like this from happening is moving away from the fossil fuel industry. Right. Like c completely. Uh, Basically eliminating natural gas is the only way to prevent the risks of that. Yeah. If, I mean, if, if you have if you have natural gas wells, you have natural gas pipelines, you're going to you're going to have you're going to have spills and you're going to have accidents. Uh, it, Although Pemex seems to does seem to have a lot of accidents. I'm sure that yes, yeah. yes. I mean, you can certainly you know reduce the number of accidents you have by by better regulation, uh, but you, you you can't you can't eliminate uh, error, uh, and, and you know hur hurricanes and other natural disasters are going to bring disasters even even to the the most well regulated uh, industries. It is it is amazing uh, for the infrastructure package that all of these climate related incidents are happening at the same time to f to focus. Uh, Washington's attention and focus Democrats' attention on making sure that climate gets in there. Over the last month, you started seeing Democrats saying, you know, no climate, you know, no, no deal. That, that this is where they were going to draw the red line. Uh, and, and then you have the, the condo collapse in Miami, which was demolished, you know, fully over, over the weekend, which we don't know exactly what happened there. But we do, we do know that, uh, you know, the sea is rising. And, and, and salt water was soaking the, the, the parking garage the, in, the entire time, you have this just absolutely brutal heat wave all over the planet. And so it is really focusing people's attention on, on climate, and it is going to, I think, Inf influence how much climate spending gets into the infrastructure package. Yeah, the, the condo collapses, I find that to be an instructive example because, and we talked about this with David Sirota, it is a good example of how we have this sense that things like wildfires are increasing and what's actually happening is that humans are increasingly concentrating in areas that weren't always habitable for human mm -hmm. beings and the condo, sadly, is a good example where you have this massive living complex right on the beach, basically, right. in Miami. And so th when, when things are exacerbated by salt water and sea level changes, it, 
it touches humans to a greater degree because we've had these technologies that have allowed us to develop in areas that have been previously claimed by nature. Um, and so that's a huge thing with wildfires in California, for instance. You have tons of developments mm -hmm. in areas that just get absolutely wiped out. Um, and speaking, by the way, of the condo collapse, Tropical Storm Elsa prompted officials in Surfside to push up the demolition of the condominium in South Florida. As Ryan just said, the building partially collapsed last month. 28 people have been confirmed dead, but 117 are still missing. And to your point, Ryan, that all but ensures this continues to stay in the news cycle. Tragically, as the infrastructure negotiations continue, on your side, how have you seen some of these examples that probably feel very tangible to the public influence negotiations? Have they accelerated things? Have they heightened you know, sort of the energy and the activist left base that's pushing mm -hmm. for, for instance, all of these climate proposals in the reconciliation bill? Well, it certainly has em emboldened people. It's like, you know, let's say, like in the Senate, like Brian Schatz, who is, you know, the, the he, you know one of the leading climate senators, Jeff Merkley. The, you know, the, the senators who have made climate one of their main issues, like they feel like the, they have the wind at their back here and and can and can start making demands. And, and the the House side, the the squad is also feeling like because of the way that the mood around uh, climate is is changing over over the last month. Um, and particularly ar ar around that 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 heat bubble mm -hmm. over over Canada and the and the Northwest that was just punishing people and 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 bringing people around to the idea that the future is here and that while and that connecting that with the upcoming midterms with Democrats recognizing that there's a very good chance that they're going to lose one or both chambers. It gives it gives them a sense of it's now or never, like it's it's do or die. And it might be do and die, but <laughs> the, in the same way that in in spring of 2010, uh, Democrats were were pretty confident that they were that they might lose the House, uh, and, and so they pushed through Wall Street reform and the Affordable Care Act. In the same way mm. that House Republicans in, in end of 2017, early 2018, were pretty confident they were going to lose the House in 2018, so they pushed through the tax cut. Mm. There's, there, there's a new philosophy of, of governing in, in Washington, I think. I'd be curious for your take on this. That is, th because of the instability, because of all of the anger among the public out there, majorities are not going to be durable in the way that they, in the way that they used to be, unless you can completely re rewrite the rules. You know, if you remember, Carl Rove said, I think, in 2000, 2004, his goal was to affect a realignment that was going to create a permanent Republican majority. That was his fantasy. <laughs> Instead, you got a wave in 2006, another wave in 2008, and then a Republican wave in 2010, Republican wave in 2014, weird election in 2016, Democratic wave in 2018. So, so parties are understanding that when they're in power, they have to actually do something. I mean, at least for now, I think, you know, the left is certainly moving towards a place where they will be in a position to have very sizable majorities, maybe not for 10 years, but at least for now, yes, we're in this really crazy environment where nobody gets mandates anymore. And to some extent, that's mm -hmm. good. It's almost like Madisonian, right? Like government will move very slowly um, and it won't jump the shark and we'll just always have to be negotiating and compromising. But that's uh, who that actually benefits is the swamp and the establishment is, because bipartisan compromise always means grift. It always means yeah. lobbyists. Is, is that how the right sees it? That in, that say in 10 years because of demographic shifts and, and the, the fact that so many young people are Democrats that there's a real uh, headwind? Yes. There's no question about it. Um, I, I think that's absolutely mm -hmm. how the right sees it. And I, I don't think that's a, a given, but I do think that it's a very serious threat to yeah. the conservative movement. Um, and I guess you could say the Republican Party downstream of that. And it's not just because, um, I mean, it's, it's definitely has to do with demographic shifts. It has to do with young people being overwhelmingly Democratic. This is not even like, like Ronald Reagan won the youth vote twice. Mm -hmm. We are nowhere near what that used to be, right? right? There used to be this old sort of cliche that as you age, you become Republican, which has never really been true. It is certainly not going to be true with this demographic um, because, or with this generation, Generation Z and younger millennials. Uh, but I, so that's a that's a real threat, I think. And it's not a given, but I think it is something that uh, the, the right is increasingly convinced is going to be probably the biggest obstacle to 
their power in the future. It's, it's fascinating because on, on the left, Democrats are convinced that because of the shape of the Senate, the shape of the Electoral College, and voting rights laws that are being passed around the country, that they're staring down the abyss of you know, 50 years of, of never occupying power. Like bo Both parties are convinced that the other party has the upper hand going forward. It's interesting because I think to some extent that's the fear mongering on both sides that takes place at, for fundraising, especially in the sort of movement side and the I activist think they class. They're starting to, I think they believe, a lot of them believe their own fear mongering. A hundred percent. And that's, that's one of the more interesting things I think that's happened since like post Trump is that it, everybody's sort of drinking their own Kool-Aid. But I do actually think, I mean, I believe that on the right. I don't right. think it's a certainty, but I, I think that that's actually a very serious problem for people on the right. On the left, I think that is actually a very serious problem for the next 10 years. Mm -hmm. um, and then you have sort of, as you have different generations dying out and being replaced by younger voters, uh, millennials are going to start voting in higher numbers, presumably as they do get older, yeah, I think that it's a total, right. total game changer. But I do think, yeah, it takes about a decade to get there, probably. And f uh, fueling the pessimism on, on the left is the Gulf being on fire, right? And the the, the planet collapsing because there's also a shortened time horizon now uh, for for the left, which feels like you know the, we we have to turn this around now. Like it, it would be. You don't have those right. ten years. Be nice to, right. in ten years if there are congressional majorities, but at that point, you know what? What heaping pile of ash does this capital sit on? Mm. So, I'm curious if you put yourself back ten years ago. Where did you expect to be on climate? Like, if you could predict what was happening in 2021, and I don't mean with the actual climate itself, but with the um, legislative, I guess. Uh, maybe the appetite right. for climate action and then the gap between what the appetite is and what's actually done. Well, things moved really rapidly in, in the, in the mid-2000s, particularly when Coke Industries got heavily involved. Because you, you had, in the mid-2000s, you had this famous ad with uh, Newt Gingrich and Nancy Pelosi sitting on a couch like outdoors in, in Washington talking about how they, they both understood the absolute imperative of addressing climate change. And the, you, the, shortly after that, you, you start to see Republicans moving away uh, from that. In, and then in 2009 and 10, you, you have Lindsey Graham uh, leading a bill with, with John Kerry and Barbara Boxer, the climate, climate change bill, which got well over 50 votes. And, and uh, Harry Reid was actually pushing to do it through reconciliation because it, it passed the House, cap and trade bill passed the House of Representatives. And then it, it fell short of the 60, never came to a floor vote. But you had people like Lindsey Graham right. like, who, who were like, no, I'm serious. We're, we're, actually, we're actually going to do this, this climate bill with John Kerry. Um, and once that fell apart and then Republicans take over in 2010, at that point, you, you see, okay, we're not doing anything hmm. about this. Like, it, it did not move in a, in a linear fashion. It did not move in a hockey stick fashion the way that temperatures and, and carbon emissions have gone. It, it looked hopeful in the mid-2000s, and then it began to look hopeless uh, early 2010s. And now Democrats are reorienting around a completely partisan strategy and saying, we're, we're not looking for any Newt Gingriches to sit on any couches with us and come to any common sense, you know, bipartisan solutions that are going to, uh, you know, tinker at the edges. Uh, we're we're going we're gonna to go, you know, full, full into this. At, at saying the Democratic establishment it still talks about climate in a way that's, that's addressing more elite voters and, and wealthier suburban voters rather than incorporating a, a, a jobs message into it. So that's now becoming the big conflict. Can Democrats you know, actually, actually sell this to people as a way that's going to Im improve their material conditions on a daily basis, rather than the Macron neoliberal approach that he's going to, you know, just just tax the working class to 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 pay for uh, problems that are caused by the top one percent and that benefit the one percent, right. right? That that and that's going to be incredibly challenging, I think, especially on the federal level, as we were just talking about, where there's gridlock and gridlock does tend to benefit the people at the top um, already. And I think you know to the extent that we can end on something that's positive. 
Yep. The Surfside building, not positive at all, completely tragic, but if people can start getting ahead on a local level of things like that. Uh, local government still works in a lot of places. State governments still work in a lot of situations. And to, it, it, when it's possible for those governments to get ahead of something like that, to prevent something like that from happening because they're able to, within their local purview, exert more power and control and efficiency, yeah. that I think is probably the route forward. And we like still, without knowing what actually caused that, we do know that that's something that, you know, it wouldn't have been possible for people to live there not that long ago. Right. Um, and to the, again, to the extent that people can get on top of that, that would be a big deal on a local level. And it exposed an Achilles heel in, in the condo association model. Yeah. You know, that if you, if you have a dedicated block of people who don't want to pay an assessment, to do uh, an infrastructure upgrade to the to the basement, because that doesn't help my apartment. Mm -hmm. It's like when you have a cracked windshield; uh, it costs you a couple hundred dollars, and you so you spent a couple hundred dollars out of your pocket. What do you have? You have a windshield that doesn't have a crack in it. That's right. boring. And you never knew what was going to become of the crack. Right? Yeah, the crack mm -hmm. might just stay there the whole time. Yeah. And and so people, and that's what happened in this building. People fought against having to pay this assessment. So they just never made the repairs, and here we are. Right. That's actually not a bad metaphor, metaphor for right. the whole thing. Well, we'll tell you what's on our radars next. <laughs>